Our study tonight begins in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to try my best to get all the way through chapter 8, verse 14. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, as we begin tonight, can we thank you more than anything that we've never been in this alone? We just sang it, Lord. Never once. We look back and you've always been with us. May we be with you so we can hear your voice. I pray tonight that we would appreciate the sovereignty of our God, the goodness and faithfulness of God, who can take a whole world that's turned against him, and he's so powerful. Lord, you can accomplish your will no matter what anybody tries to do. Would you accomplish your will in each and every one of us tonight that we can bring you honor and glory? We love you, Lord. We need to love you more. But we can't even do that apart from the power of your spirit. Have your way in every heart. And in agreement with Pastor Elaine's prayer, if there's even one, as unlikely as it is on a midweek Old Testament Bible study night, if there's even one here who doesn't know you, then move on their hearts, Lord. He or she might be the last one, and we could be with you. Having prayed all of that, let me end with, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Full disclosure, Bible study. From this point forward, in the book of Daniel, we get more and more and more detail. It's like the old Saturday Night Live sketch. More cowbell, more cowbell. Well, this is just more detail. Honestly, some of you will find it tedious, some even boring. Open your heart and understand this is God telling the future through a prophet with such precise detail that it has to give you confidence in his plan, not just for your life individually, but in his plan for the world that we live in. Others of you will find it thrilling. And I hope as we get through chapters 8 and chapter 9 especially, which is the crescendo of the book of Daniel. And then we close with the most precise, minute detail in the closing chapters of the book. My prayer is that you'll come away with a confidence that says, my God is really God and I can trust him with my life. That's the whole point of prophecy. Paula likes puzzles. I don't have patience for puzzles. I think Paula and Daniel would have a lot in common. Paula loves putting the pieces together. And Paula and my mom used to sit up all night long and they would get these four and five thousand piece puzzles and just put them together. And they wouldn't sleep. They wouldn't do anything. I'd say, don't you guys have a life? (laughs) But they just love it. Well, Daniel is trying to put together a puzzle. And we get to be like some of you, be honest, you get a crossword puzzle and you look at the answers on the back page when you're just a little bit stumped instead of trying to think it through. We get to see the end because we live in a historical perspective where we know all of these things have come true except that which hasn't yet happened. There's a lot that hasn't yet happened. But based on the 95 or so percent of prophecy that has been fulfilled exactly as predicted, we can have confidence that Jesus really is coming soon. And if there's anyone in this room who isn't thrilled about that prospect, then talk to somebody after church. Look around at the world that we live in. Jesus is the only hope, the only answer. Verse 19 You remember in chapter 7, we talked about the four kingdoms coming up from out of the earth. We have talked about that in chapter 2. It was man's perspective in the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. In chapter 7, it was a perspective from heaven. What man valued, God sees as beasts. We introduced ourselves to those beasts last time. It was natural then for Daniel to want to know even more. Verse 19, 
says, then I wanted to know. I'm going to stop there for a moment because being curious about the things of the end is a really, really good thing. We should be thinking about what it's going to be like in heaven. We should be thinking about the, that moment when we're called to be in heaven with Jesus. We should want to know what the next thing is going to be. And as you know here at Calvary Chapel, the very next thing in the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. We ought to be curious about that. But more than just curious, we ought to be motivated to tell people about our Jesus. The time is short. Paul says that we're to redeem the time, making the most of every opportunity. And if you're really curious about the end and you dig in and find out, well, the only thing left for us to do is to find people and tell them about the God who loves them before it's too late. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all of the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. Before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth, that's strange, that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging against the saints and underline or highlight the next. If you have a King James, it says, and prevailed against them. That's a better translation than the NIV, which says, and was defeating them. Now, obviously, we talked last week about this fourth beast, and this was going down into the, the long-term fulfillment of the prophecy to the very end and pictured the man that we call the Antichrist. Now, he's not going to identify himself as the Antichrist. He wants to be God, he wants to be worshipped, but he is the most terrifying of all, and Daniel's vision goes all the way down to the very end of time. Now, those who are believers in a post-tribulation rapture, or even a mid-tribulation rapture, they point to this passage as proof that the church will be on the earth during the Great Tribulation, but that's not so. Jesus said this, the devil will not prevail against his church. This says they were prevailing against the saints. So we've got to understand who the saints are. And I told you in an earlier study, from Daniel's perspective, the only saints he knows anything about are Jews, Israel. He knows nothing about the church. That's why Daniel is going to be told later to seal up this vision for it deals with the very end. Daniel doesn't have all of the information that you and I have. So when Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, it makes it impossible for this to be the presence of the church on earth and can only mean Jews. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, see all of it, discourse, beginning in verse 21, he said, from then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Now, obviously, the days will be shortened because that's what Jesus said, and all true Israel will be saved. How? Enter Jesus. Look at verse 22. <coughs> Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. There's so much that's thrilling about this. I don't have time to go into it all. But on Friday night in Revelation chapter 5, our study has finally come to the place where the church is in heaven. And we find that John sees the Ancient of Days. And there's a scroll, the title deed to the earth, and no one is able to open the scroll. No one is worthy to open the scroll. And here comes Jesus. And he's worthy, he's found worthy. It's almost like there's a standing ovation in heaven when he comes in. And John, who was crying only moments before, is suddenly rejoicing because the earth is going to revert to its original purpose. Well, this is that scene as Daniel perceives it. The Ancient of Days is the throne of the Father. And the Ancient of Days is going to pronounce judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. Jesus is going to be the instrument through whom he does it. 
this day will be a great, wonderful day on earth. It's the day when Israel, according to Zechariah chapter 12, will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly, bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. And we learn from Zechariah chapter 14 that on that day, one-third of the individual Jews are going to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Two-thirds are going to be lost because they still refuse to turn from sin and turn to him. But remember, this deals with Israel. Daniel's prophecy does. So too does the Great Tribulation. It deals with Israel. So Daniel says he was curious. He, this is an angel. Gabriel will be introduced later. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And then another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. Now, pay attention to the tenses that are used in this passage. The fourth beast will appear. That's from Daniel's historical perspective. But for you and me, this is also from our future perspective. This is still yet to happen in this earth. We haven't seen the entire earth devoured by one man yet. Now, there's been a lot of demon-possessed people, devil-possessed people who have tried, but God is still the one in control. But he's never going to give up the devil, and the Antichrist is going to be his man. Now, the Roman Empire, as we discussed in a previous study, was never defeated militarily but it's described accurately here. But the horn did not arise, nor did the tin horns in our earlier descriptions. Is that a failed prophecy? No, it just is proof that this hasn't yet happened. In this case, as I said, the will arise from verse 24 is yet future. Now, there's a growing number of Christians, and this is not a good thing, but there's a growing number of Christians who believe that all biblical prophecy has been fulfilled. All of it. 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. They're called preterists. That's the theological term. And they believe that all the prophecy has been fulfilled. And so nothing yet uh, is to be unfulfilled. Obviously, that can't be true because these prophecies, along with the entire book of Revelation, has not yet been fulfilled. That means that we need to take literally these predictions because God has spoken to them in so, in so many different places. Four different places just in this book alone that there are ten toes and ten horns yet to come. So we've got to be consistent in our interpretation of Scripture. Verse 25, speaking of the Antichrist, <coughs> says, He will speak against the Most High, and oppress his saints, and try to change the set times and the laws. Now, I tell you all the time that sin is insane. Satan is literally insane. He actually thinks he can win. He's plotting this very moment. This is They plot things in your life. Peter says that we're not to be unaware of his schemes. Well, he's plotting to take over the world. He's trying to figure out anything and everything he can do. The time is short, and so he gets more and more angry. And so he's trying to set or change the set times and laws. He believes that he's going to prevail. It says in the rest of verse 25, the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half of time. Now that's a very familiar application in Old Testament prophecy. It means three and a half years. We see it in 42 months. We see it identified as 1260 days in this particular case. It's three and a half years. And what he's talking about is in the second three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, he is going to do everything he can to pursue Jews with the intention of wiping them all out. Much, much more on that in chapter 9. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away. 
and he will be completely destroyed forever. We ought to have a hand clap there. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole, whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. Now, based on this verse, it ought to be so obvious that all prophecy has not been fulfilled. We know these things haven't yet happened. So what he's talking about is nothing other than the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, and we know that hasn't happened as well. And then Daniel says, and I love the understated nature of this, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. How would you describe that to anybody else? How could you possibly understand that anything that he saw would be true. We've tried telling people about the rapture of the church. They look at us like we have a third eye in the middle of our forehead. I had a question on the radio show today from a concerned mom. How do I get my grown kids to understand that the rapture is going to happen and it's going to happen soon? She even suggested that maybe she could make a little care package for him after the rapture because they're going to be left behind. She's told him over and over, but she said the more she talks about the further away they get. Only God can convince people. Only the Holy Spirit can convince people of the truth and the need to turn from sin. And, and let me make this clear. The reason people don't want to believe in the rapture of the church is simple. It's not because they don't have the evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. The reason is they don't want to stop sinning. It's the only reason that anybody rejects Jesus Christ. This is the best deal we've been given in the history of our world. We're sinners. We're the worst of the worst. And Jesus says, let me give you the best of the best. Think about that for a moment. I'll take your filth, you take my righteousness, and we'll call it even, and we'll live together forever in heaven. Well, remember, Daniel knew nothing about the church. So all he can do is take the matter to heart and keep it to himself. Daniel chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, that's a name from the past, chapter 5, this is 551 B.C., this vision is some two years after the vision of chapter 7, 12 years before the events that we've already studied in chapter 5. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. Now, if you remember, I told you that chapter 2, verse 4, through all of chapter 7, is written in Aramaic. That's because it deals with the world around. But here in chapter 8, the emphasis of the prophecies returns to the people of God, the saints of Israel, and the language now turns to Hebrew from the rest of the chapter, from this point forward to the end of the book. He says, and this stuff fascinates me, in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa. Now, Susa wasn't even built at this point. It won't be built for another 200 years. And Daniel sees himself in the citadel or the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Now, this interests me so much Maybe because I'm one who doesn't have dreams or visions. I have a lot of nightmares, but I don't get dreams like this. But it's just fascinating to me. This doesn't say Daniel was in Susa or ancient Shushan. It's 200 miles away from where they are. But it's where he saw himself. Have you ever been in a dream where you were in it and you couldn't get out of it? Even if you wanted to get out of it? That describes most of my nightmares. But Daniel sees himself in this dream. How interesting is that? He sees himself in a place that's 200 miles away. And it's not a place that he would recognize other than being told where he is because this is a rather inconsequential, insignificant place. It was an unimportant city at the time Daniel had received this vision. But God knew, you see, later this would become the capital of the Persian Empire. 
And because this is before chapter 5 of Daniel, Belshazzar's fall, Babylon's fall, the Medes and the Persians aren't even thought of at this point as a serious problem. Because Persia here is the first empire Daniel sees. That's why he sees himself in Susa. Here's the first beast. I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns. Horns are always a symbol of power in scripture. Standing beside the canal and the horns were long. Now the ancient symbol of Persia was a ram. We've talked about that in the past. In battles, the emperor of Persia would wear a jeweled ram's head as a helmet. That's kind of creepy. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. Now the long horn here is Cyrus the Great. Another fascinating example of prophecy. He was a man chosen by God to defeat the Babylonian Empire. What's interesting about Cyrus is he was named by God by name 150 years before he was even born in the prophecy of Isaiah. More than 150 years, my servant Cyrus, we're told. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him. It's too easy to say he was ram tough, dodge tough. And none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Now Cyrus did indeed push west and north and south just as is described by Daniel long before the events ever occurred. He conquered every people, small and large, including what was thought to be impenetrable Babylon, and he could withstand everyone until he met Alexander the Great, who we're going to meet again in just a moment. Cyrus, raised by God, was kind to Israel. He permitted them to return to their homeland to rebuild and restore the temple. We have evidence of that in Ezra and Nehemiah and to restore their walls for defense. He also permitted them to return some of the sacred vessels from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen or taken away into captivity in Babylon. Now even before he was born, Isaiah said he was called in righteousness. It's Isaiah chapter 41. Now think about that for a minute. It doesn't mean that Cyrus was a righteous man. It meant that he was called by God and given a righteous cause. I love the way that God uses people that don't want anything to do with him. God deposes kings. He sets up kings. He establishes them. The will of God, the spirit of God moves the hearts and the minds and the feet of kings. In this case, Cyrus was God's servant. What this means is that he wasn't a believer in God, but rather he was used by God to fulfill righteous purposes. Now, for you and for me, especially in the time that we live, the next time that we think the problems in our nation are too great for God, think about this. Think about this. I love Nehemiah and I get carried away so I can't go too long. But I love Nehemiah. When he had a burden on his heart, he didn't understand the burden. His burden was for his people who were defenseless. And when the king saw that he was down, he said, what's the matter? This can only be sadness of soul. And Nehemiah said, well, why wouldn't I be sad? My city lies in ruins and the people that I love there are without defense. And you remember what the king said to him? What do you want? And then I love those three words. Then I prayed. What would you say if somebody said, what do you want? What would you say if God said, what do you want? I hope you would have three words. Then I prayed. And God met him. And he gave him such a laundry list of stuff that he needed. And every single provision on that list was granted to him. All because the Medes and the Persians were favorably disposed to Israel by the hand of God. Again, Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah detail some of the events around this time. He says, as I was thinking about this, now Daniel's pensive, I like that. 
It's not just he, he gets something and he, and he says, wow, that was pretty neat. He, he thinks about it. He's trying to consider the ramifications of all of this. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, and this is exactly how Alexander came. He went from west to east, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. Now this refers to Alexander who moved his armies at lightning-like speed. We talked about that in chapter 2. What's fascinating about this prophecy is that to Daniel, from his perspective, Greece was anything but a world power on the rise. It would be like you and I saying 200 years from now, Canada is going to be the, the, the overwhelming power in the world. Nobody would believe that. Well, to Daniel to hear that Greece could conquer Mede, the Medes and Persians, Daniel would, that, that, that just isn't possible. But God, of course, is telling the future because God lives outside of time and space. It says in verse 6, He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. He hated the Medes and Persians, Alexander did. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, and it's actually exceedingly great. But at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in his place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Now we told you who the four replacements were. Alexander's kingdom was distributed among four top generals. We learned that in chapter 7 because Alexander died unexpectedly at the age of 33 in 323 B.C. Now I find it fascinating here again that God uses the phrase that the four horns grew up toward the winds of heaven. What is meant by that is that they were permitted to reign by the power of God or by the authority of God. God used Greece. Now this is, again, if you like history, this is neat stuff. But God used Greece to rid the world of the oriental influence that threatened to take over the world at the time. Remember I said that Alexander hated the Persians. He'd encountered them in battle as a young man and couldn't overcome them, and he made it the goal of his life to destroy him. Well, the Medes and the Persians were taking over the world, and they would have taken over the entirety, including Israel, if God wasn't involved. It was also Alexander who ordered some 9,000 of his soldiers to intermarry with Persian women, a process of assimilation. He wanted to literally breed them out of existence. And just when you think you have a plan, you've got your four generals doing this, enter the next piece. Verse 9. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. Now this is a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. He is a type of the Antichrist. I'll explain why in a moment. But this is the most ruthless and Certainly a demon-possessed man. Probably the most ruthless man who's ever walked the face of the earth. He served under King Seleucus, his brother, Seleucus, one of the generals. He gained control of the throne by murdering that same brother and holding his brother's son, his own nephew, hostage in Rome. That's how he came to power. His horn, verse 10 says, it grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. This is a prophetic way of describing Jewish people. He was going to kill the Jews and he was absolutely determined to rid the world of the Jewish race. Again, biblically these are symbols both for military leaders and for God's people. The idea here is that every military leader and every Jew who opposed him would be killed. He had no patience for insurrection at all. By some estimates, Antiochus was personally responsible for the death of in excess of 100,000 Jews. 
Verse 11 says, It or he set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered, as it seems like evil always seems to. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Now, out of one of the four kingdoms left from Alexander's reign, this monster was created. He started out small, an insignificant figure, but he grew into one of the most cruel rulers the world has ever known. And I personally believe, and there's no way to prove this, but I personally believe that he came to power because of being possessed by the devil. Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a Syrian who would rule for 12 years, and the trail of blood he left behind was devastating. We get our English word epiphany from the same word from which he took his name. It means illustrious or manifestation. Practically speaking, it means that he believed himself to be the manifestation of the gods. He even minted a coin with his likeness on it. And people would look at the coin and say, hmm, looks remarkably like Zeus, the Greek god. Well, we can see the tendencies that make him a forerunner or a type of the Antichrist. He was determined not just to rob the Jews of their Jewish heritage. Lots of people have done that throughout history. But he wanted to rid Jews from the earth. And because Jews resisted he was filled with rage and made the goal of his life destroying them completely. In 168 BC, along with 20,000 soldiers, he ordered the city and the temple to be utterly wiped out. And he did. He actually sacrificed the pig on the altar in the Holy of Holies. And I told you he's a type of the Antichrist. We know, and we'll get this in Daniel chapter 9, we know that the Antichrist at the very end, I told you last time, the prophecy has both short-term and long-term fulfillment. The Antichrist is going to desecrate the Holy of Holies in the rebuilt temp temple in the Great Tribulation, and he's going to do it by setting up an image of himself and demanding to be worshipped. That's going to happen at the three-and-a-half-year mark of the Great Tribulation. That's when the Jews are going to run to the rock city of Petra in Jordan, and God is going to preserve those who listen, those who would run away to be protected. He made it a law that to possess the law of God was punishable by death. He was determined to destroy them. Then I heard a holy one speaking. Now, this is an angel. And remember, I'm gonna, we're going to be introduced to Gabriel by name. I believe that the angel here that's sort of giving the play-by-play -play on these visions is Gabriel. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary, and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. Obviously, Daniel had no idea, didn't know the questions to ask. So the angels are asking the question among themselves. Daniel is just a participant. He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary, sanctuary will be re-consecrated. Now, this has caused no end of confusion about prophecy and what it means, because there's no way to know what 2,300 evenings and morning means. This passage of scripture has provoked so many people to foolishly set dates and times for everything from the rapture of the church to the second coming of Christ, and it's all because they think they've got something figured out. Ellen G. White, who was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists, concluded that Jesus was coming in 1844. Obviously, he didn't. She was wrong. But then she said he did come, but only those of us with special insight were given the truth. There are others, many others, who took this to mean that the days here were years, and one man, a man named William Miller, thinking that the 2,300 days were 2,300 years, said Jesus was coming back in 1843. Guess what? He was wrong 
as well. And the point is, and the only reason I bring that up is because nobody knows and there's no reason to speculate. How many times, and some of you will remember the name Harold Camping, he had a national radio ministry. He was on all the time. He predicted 13 separate dates that Jesus was coming. And after everyone failed, he did some more calculations. Oh, I was wrong here. It's going to be this. And, and finally, after the last one, he sort of gave up. And, and camping, if he was a Christian, uh, has gone to be with Jesus. If he wasn't a Christian, well, we know also where he is. So no one knows what it means, and we need to stay out of these discussions about trying to figure out when the rapture is going to happen or figure out when the second coming. No one knows the day or the hour. Now, Jews are sacrificed in the morning and evening. So I'm going to give you just a couple possibilities. It's possible this number means 1,150 days or a little more than three years. If the 2,300 is full, Mornings and evenings just to mean one day. Others say that 2,300 mornings and 2,300 evenings, full days, would make it more than six years. Again, there's no value in trying to figure out what that means. Daniel's confused, I'm confused, and the angels didn't straighten him out, so there's nothing that I'm going to be able to say that's going to provide an answer for this whether it was at the beginning of Antiochus' reign or when the temple was actually desecrated, nobody knows when all of this began. What we do know is this. At some point, God raised up a hero. The Maccabees, and in particular, Judas Maccabees, he and his followers would eventually be so incensed at the declaration of God's temple, at the I'm sorry, the desecration of God's temple, that they would rebel and have a great, however improbable, victory. When I think of Judas Maccabees, and historically there's a lot out there, and it's really fascinating reading, but I always think of Jonathan and his armor bearer. You know, when Jonathan looked at his armor bearer, Saul was sitting under the tree, um, dressed like a king, but not acting like a king. And Jonathan looked at his armor bearer and said, you know, God may want us to give us a great victory today. He can deliver through many or, th or through few. And the armor bearer said, go for it. I'm with you heart and soul. And they went up into this great victory over the Philistines and, and really brought embarrassment to Saul and the army that was kind of sitting around on the sidelines. Get in the game is the point of that passage of Scripture. Well, Judas Maccabee was one of those people. The celebration of Hanukkah celebrates his great victory. As a result of that, after his reign for 12 years, Antiochus would go to Persian disgrace where he would go insane and die in 163 B.C. Now, that detail, because everything Antiochus did foreshadows what the Antichrist will do. They both want to be God. They both want to be worshipped. Both hated the Jews. Both desecrate a Jewish temple of their time. Both kill everything and anyone that stands in their way. So this is one of those near fulfillment visions that also portends down to the end of time and space. And when we get to Daniel chapter 9, you're going to see the amazing similarities and the unbelievable detail. Please read ahead uh, into chapter 9. It is absolutely fascinating. One of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Gabriel, as I said, who's going to show up soon, tells us it has long-term fulfillment as well. That's one of the things that makes prophecy so fascinating. Now, why all of this detail? And why is it important for us? It's important. You might want to write this down. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. And we need to be ready. All of this precise detail, and you haven't seen anything yet in terms of detail. It's God who lives outside of time and space. We told you at the beginning of this book in Daniel that there are critics of Daniel who claim that Daniel didn't write this book because he couldn't have written this book because the prophecies that happened so far after Daniel was gone were fulfilled so specifically that there had to be other authors of the book of Daniel. 
But particularly relating to Daniel chapter 9, Jesus himself says, Daniel said, and then he quotes chapter 9. We need to understand that all of these things are actually going to happen. The prophecies yet to be fulfilled all deal with the very end. And what that means is our role now is to go out and tell people about Jesus. The parable of the sower, our job is to scatter seed. The seed is the word of God. That's our responsibility. It's not an option for us. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says that every single one of us is here at exactly the right time in exactly the right place to make it easier to find God's will for our lives. You and I are here and we have a mission. And that mission is to tell people about Jesus. You know, when we were singing this song one way, we haven't sung the song in a really long time. And it's on one way. Uh, I'm old enough to be in the Jesus people movement, but I wasn't. I was stubborn and proud and came to faith in Christ much later. But you hang around those old hippies who got saved. And that was on their lips and on their fingers one way. You say, hey, brother, that was great. So no, all, all in. One way. There's only one way. And it's your responsibility and mine to tell people about that one way every single day of your life. I pray that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. That's Paul's exhortation to Philemon, Pastor Philemon, in the sixth verse of that treasure. I pray, Calvary Chapel, that you're active in sharing your faith. The world that we live in is an absolute mess right now. An absolute mess. We have Christians who'd rather talk about vaccinations and masks than Jesus. When Pastor Gino was here for the retreat, we were talking. Um, I have a live radio show. He has a live radio show. I said, so, so tell me, what kind of questions are you getting? And he said, half of the questions I get are about masks and vaccinations. I told him, I said, well, I guess I'm luckier than you because my people want to hear about Jesus. It's our responsibility to tell people. He's coming soon to a world that's rejected him. And you have loved ones that are on that list. So live your life filled with joy. Live your life in the power of the Spirit. Make sure the fruit that comes in your life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Make sure that everybody who looks at you is seeing Jesus because that will open opportunities for you with your mouth to tell them about Jesus. I'll close with this. Every time I say this, people say, but pastor, I don't know enough to tell people about Jesus. Well, you've got a Bible. Start reading it. The time is short. The hour is urgent. And we got people we love who are going to hell. If the rapture happens as quickly as I think it's going to happen, they're going to be left behind in the Great Tribulation. Think about that, what we've studied so far about the Great Tribulation. Tell them about Jesus. But Pastor Ron, they've been saying for 2,000 years that Jesus is coming, and he hasn't. Frankly, there's a lot of people who are just rapture weary. Here's the balance. We live our lives every day like we could see him in the next instant. I told you I still get up, look at the eastern sky every morning. This morning is a little bit of a bummer because it were clouds. But look at the eastern sky. That's where he's coming from. And we're going to be called up to meet him in the air. It could happen at any moment. And that should be the most thrilling prospect any of us could even consider. But we also have to live our lives like we're in it for the long haul. 
my pastor, Pastor Chuck, never worried about his lung cancer. He used to say, oh, Jesus will be back before that. Well, he was wrong. Now that I'm 100 years old, I thought Jesus would be back before this. But you know what? It fuels my passion to serve him, to tell people about him. And if I die before the rapture of the church happens, I want Jesus to look at me on the way up or when I stand before him, and I want him to say, well done. Calvary, this is the city. This is the place God's placed us. We have got to be about our Father's business. Please read ahead, finish this chapter, and get into chapter 9 and really dig in. It is absolutely amazing stuff. Let's pray.